So with financial reporting, basically, we're going to be looking at first conceptual, or we need to look at conceptual framework and regulatory framework, where we're going to be discussing various issues such as the objectives of financial statements. We're going to be looking at issues such as users of financial statements. We're going to be discussing elements of financial statements. Recognition of these elements. And measurement basis. And then still under that, we will conclude on issues such as the qualitative characteristics of financial statements. So, Typically, theory areas that you will be reading on, objective of financial statements, users of financial statements, elements of the financial statements, how we recognize and measure elements, then qualitative characteristics of financial statements. From conceptual framework, like to take uh, talk about accounting standards. So the IASs and then the IFRSs. From there, we discuss the published account or published financial statement, where we're going to be looking at the statement of financial performance, statement of financial position. Then we'll look at the cash flow statement. So now the reason why we need to build it up in this manner is that number one, I'm not going to really go through everything here because it's a reading area. I'll just guide you on the things that you have to read. I'm just going to be focusing on issues about the elements, discuss or describe the various elements, then I'll switch my attention quickly to the accounting standards. Because when we are doing the accounting standards, we will look at recognition and measurement of the elements in the financial statement. Then about the qualitative characteristics, there are things that you have to read on your own. So I'll just guide you to read on those things. So I'll not be doing those things much in class. Now, when we look at accounting standards, the reason why we need to look at this before that is that the only way we can effectively prepare our financial statements and understand what we are doing very well is when we are strong in our accounting standards. Because the footnotes to the financial statement are broadly going to be based on accounting standards. So we need to understand our accounting standards. So once we understand the accounting standards, then we are good to now prepare what? The financial statement. But then, when we are looking at the public financial statement, this is for a single entity, like a company. But then, what if we have a group entity? So from here, we come to the group financial statements. And this is going to be a very simple group where we look at a parent company that has one subsidiary and then possibly a joint venture or an associate. So it's going to be a simple group structure. Corporate reporting, that is in level three or part three, is where you'll be doing a complex group structure, where you have a parent has a subsidiary, and that subsidiary also has a control over another company and other things. But at this level, it's just going to be a simple group structure. Right after that one, we look at the final aspect, which is the interpretation of financial statements, ratios. So it's just a build-up of what you did in F3, basically, subject to the fact that you remember everything you did in F3. You remember them, right? Some. Some, right. So you did group accounts in F3, some introduction to it. Here, we'll take it a step further. Interpretation of financial statement, just almost the same thing as what is in F3. Publish account, what is in F3, we keep it a notch of all of these things which you have an idea over. Then the accounting standards, F3, we didn't really look at accounting standards, but here we're going to be taking them more seriously. So these are the five things we're going to be looking at, and the questions are going to be spread across this one, these 
in the exam hall. So it's very important that each aspect is known very well and you understand what it entails in each of the aspects. So let's begin our discussion with elements of the financial statements straight up. Then I'll turn my attention to the accounting standards. Now, when it comes to financial statements, what are the elements in a financial statement? Assets, uh huh. Liabilities, revenue, or income. You're going to tell me the difference between the two. Um, expenses. What else? Equity or capital. So, what are assets? What are assets? You saw the definition. You have sold the definition. Yeah. <laughs> so how much money did you take? <laughs> For free. They didn't sell. You, you, you dash it as a gift. What about liabilities? I'm even after, but uh -huh. I can't really... Okay, don't tell me the dito dito like the word for word. If we say an asset, per your understanding from FR and as a personal student now, what would you think is an asset is or assets are? A property owned by a business. Properties owned by a business. Owned or controlled. By a business. Yes. Okay. Then what about liabilities? <laughs> what about liabilities? You are trying to put your body on whole words, they are not coming in. Eh? Alright, what about what's the difference between revenue and income? Are they the same? Okay, what so what's the difference? Come on, give a shot. Give a shot in your own words. Give a shot. But the real difference. Okay, so let's say um, I sell goods, right? Let's say I sell water. When I sell the water, I receive money. Is that a revenue or an income? That's a revenue. So what then will be my income? Coming in. I am a shop owner. I sell this water. So you come to buy. I sell. I receive money. Everybody sells. I receive money. The money I'm receiving, is that a revenue of the business or the income of the business? That's a revenue. That's a revenue. Okay. I'm the same person selling the water. I use uh, the PC for my data entry. Then my PC broke down and I sold the PC. The money I get from the PC, is it a revenue or is it an income? That's why it's an income. Why? Now you are there. <laughs> why? The core operations or the core activities of the business. Yeah. So the income has to do with money that we receive from what? The non-core activities of the business. I hope you get the idea. Right. So let's take the definition for what assets are. Like you said, you, you mentioned own, but you change it to become control. Because really, when we say assets, it's not about things that the business owns. It's just about things that the business owns controls. That's very important. So, assets. These are resources. These are resources. These are resources that are controlled by an entity. These are resources that are controlled by an entity as a result of past events. As a result of past events. from which future economic benefits will flow to the entity. From which future economic benefits will flow to the entity. From which future economic benefits will flow to the entity. So, 
that is an asset. So when you come and you take this asset, the reason why it is not about what you own, but rather what you control, is that when it comes to assets, you, you have two choices. You can purchase the asset or you can lease the asset. When you purchase the asset, you have paid money for it, so you now own it. But when you lease the asset, and when it comes to leases, we'll look at this in the, uh, later on, we have the finance lease and then the um, operating lease. Operating lease is like normal rates, but the finance lease is capital lease, where there is transfer of risks and ownership. So legally, you don't own the assets, but because of the substance of the transaction, that there is a transfer of rights and uh, uh, risks and re rewards of the asset to you, the asset becomes literally your own. It means you control how the asset is used and the revenue that is generated from the asset doesn't go to the owner of the asset, but it comes to you. That is why we don't use the word own, but we use the word what? control. Then we say that the future economic benefits of the asset. Now, future economic benefits simply means it can be revenue, it can be income, or it can be potential services of the asset. These three things can be what we refer to as the future economic benefit. Now, when we buy this laptop, you realize that this laptop will directly not give us money. Agree? For my business. Directly is not giving us money. But then it has what? A potential service that it renders to the business. So if this laptop can render that potential service to us, then it becomes what? An asset. On the other hand, if I go and buy this water, which I am reselling, it's also an asset in terms of inventory, and that will bring me what? Revenue. So this future economic benefit could be a revenue, it could be an income, or it could be a property. One of the things that it can be an income is where you have investment property. And we'll look at that one later on, IAS Fox, where you buy an asset, and it is not for use for the business, or not occupied, but it is for rental purposes or for capital appreciation. So in that case, I am going to be receiving what? Income and not revenue. So anytime we have the rights to control an asset, and any of these three things are going to flow directly to the entity, then that is what an asset to us. So not necessarily about we paying and owning the asset, but it's about controlling how the asset is used. Two, liabilities. Liabilities. These are present obligations these are present obligations as a result of past events. These are present obligations as a result of past events. The settlement of which results into an outflow. The settlement of which results into an outflow. The settlement of which results into an outflow of the economic benefits of the economic benefits embodying the entity of the economic benefits embodying the entity now we will be looking at liabilities later on in details specifically under IAS 37 provisions contingent liabilities and contingent assets We'll be looking at that later on. But then it is a present obligation, meaning you, you are obliged to make a payment as a result of a decision you made in the past. So if, for instance, we enter into contracts that I should teach you, you will pay me $2,000. We sign the contract. Whether you pay me at the time that we have signed the contract or not, it has become your obligation. And you're going to pay. Now, once you are settling it, Future eco or economic benefits, meaning that your resources, your money. Now, you could pay me in various forms, like you can transfer an asset to me, or you can give me physical cash. So the economic benefit of the entity, of you, is going to flow out. Unlike assets, 
which is coming in liabilities flow out usually. Then let's come to revenue. It is defined as the gross inflow of economic benefits. It is defined as the gross inflow of economic benefits of an entity from the sale from the sale of products or services from the sale of products or services or as a result of a decrease in liability or as a result of decrease in liability so note for revenue we are getting the money from the core operations of the business or core activities of the business. So that is the gross inflow. The, that gross inflow is coming from core activities. Then we come to income. Okay, so income. It is the gross inflow of economic benefits to an entity. Gross inflow of economic benefits to an entity, usually from non core activities usually from non-core activities usually from non-core activities so let me let me make something clear here so if we are a school so let's say this whole floor belongs to us and we are using about one two maybe three and the rest of the floors we lease them out it means the rest of we will account for the ones we are using as owner occupied. Hence, that will be accounted for according to IAS 16. Now, the part we have leased out will be accounted for according to IAS 40, that is investment property. Then, the money that we receive from the rent, from the lease, we will account for that as an income and not a revenue. But if a real estate company that is the job they do. They have their buildings and then they lease it out. Then that one, they will not be receiving income, but they will be receiving what? Revenue, because that's their core activity. So it is about the extension between the core activities and the non-core. If the money is coming from the core operations of the business, then it's a revenue. If it is coming from non-core operations of the business, it's an income. Next one, expenses. What are expenses? What are expenses? Yeah. <laughs> what are expenses? Expense. Expense. So if you say you spent 20 Ghana cities to be here today, that is an expense, right? So what is expense? What's an expense? Okay, so let's put it this way. So let's take the definition. It can be defined as the amount of expenditure can be defined as the amount of expenditure incurred in an activity, a process, or an undertaking. It can be defined as the amount of expenditure incurred in an activity a process or an undertaking. The settlement of which results into an outflow of economic benefits. The settlement of which results into an outflow of economic benefits. So that is what you have to understand about expenses. Then the last one, equity. What's equity? That's very simple. What's equity? Accounting equation. Do you remember accounting equation? Yes. What is accounting equation? Like um, equity is equal to 
Liabilities plus assets. Are you sure you're not lying? Maybe. <laughs> 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 maybe. <laughs> Equity is equal to assets minus, minus liabilities. Because your assets equals the equity plus liability. So equity or capital is the residual of assets after liabilities. That's all the definition. It is the residual of assets after liabilities. The residual of assets after liabilities. Right. So these are the core, these are the elements in, in financial statements. And everything we're going to be doing, everything we are going to be doing in financial reporting is either going to be about assets, about liabilities, about income, rev, about expenses, or about the capital of a business. Everything is just centered around this. Right, so this is the thing I'm going to be touching on that. The rest of the issues like the qualitative characteristics of financial statement, I want you to read it on your own. Um, qualitative characteristics, financial statement have to be faithfully presented, they have to be consistent, they have to be understandable, like those things, so just read on them, and then if you have any challenge, you let me know. So that I can switch my gear and go straight to accounting standards. And we're going to be starting with assets. And starting with assets, we're going to first start with tangible non-carried assets. So the first thing is to look at IAS 16, property, plants, and equipment. Now, IAS 16 prescribe or describe how a company accounts for what? Property, plants, and equipment that are used that are owner occupied. The word is owner occupied. When you see the word owner occupied, it simply means that the business is using the assets for business purposes. That's the meaning of the word owner occupied. So, IAS 16 gives us how to account for the properties, land and building, the plants that we use in our factories, the equipment that we are using in our administrative department how we account for those assets which we are using to generate our revenue or as part of our activities. In doing so, we have to look at what constitutes the cost of the assets. We have to look at the recognition criteria of the assets. We have to look at the initial measurement of the assets. We have to look at subsequent measurement of the asset. Then we will conclude on the disclosure requirement of the assets. All of these are listed in IAS 16. So let's start with what constitutes the cost of the assets. So what do you think should constitute the cost of the property, plants, and equipment? Now, to help you process that question, I'm going to put an illustration on the board. Let's say that we are buying, um, let's buy something from China. What should we buy? Laptop. So we buy a laptop from China for our business. And then let's say that the amount, the price of the of the product is, let's just say $500 or $600, some call I7. Then let's say that we're going to pay for shipment for say, maybe just $150. Then let's say we're going to also, when the things reach Ghana, we're going to go for it. So that's delivery cost in Ghana from the place or from the port to our business location, it's say 50 Ghana. Then we need to bring in an expert to come and fix the laptop for us, set it up. So say set up cost 
of say um, $30. The question is, this laptop that we are going to buy, how should we, what amount must we recognize in the financial statement as the cost of the plant, of the laptop? Do we recognize how much money we paid as the cost of the assets, or we recognize both the cost plus the shipment, or how? Or we just recognize this as the cost of the laptop, then the rest should be expenses. What do you think? The, the $600 is the cost of the laptop. Yes. And the rest is the expense. The rest should be expense. Why do you think so? Because the, um, the shipment and those deliveries are not directly, like, we don't really import directly into that. Into the assets? Yes. Okay. So immediately you say that International Accountant Standard Board will say a liar has a tail because you have lied. <laughs> the standard states that all costs incurred directly in bringing the assets to its present use and making it ready for use must be recognized in the financial statement as, or must be capitalized as part of the cost of the asset. So for that line, it means what you said is a lie because shipment is part of it. We wouldn't have paid the shipment if not for the laptop. We wouldn't have paid for the delivery if not for the laptop. The guy we paid to come and fix the machine for us, we wouldn't have paid him if not for the laptop. So the standard says we recognize all costs that are associated directly to the bringing of the assets to its present use. For that reason, we say that the cost of property, plants, and equipment includes the actual price, or the purchases price, delivery cost, installment cost, or what we call setup cost, then legal fees. Sometimes there are some assets, before we buy it, we need to take some advice from some people. So all those fees must also be what, capitalized. Then there are some assets. When we install them like plants, after they are used, they must be dismantled. So we will incur dismantling cost. Now that is in the future, but we have to find the present value of that amount and bring it to today's step. And that is going to be dismantling cost. We will look at this in detail in IAS 37 when we are dealing with uh, environmental costs later on. But all costs, so in other words, all the costs we are incurring in bringing the asset to its present usage must be uh, seen as what? Well, the cost of the asset. So, for double entry purposes, it means that all my total bills be $830, I guess. Yes. So with this $830, initial recognition of this $830 simply means that I'm going to be debited property, plant, and equipment with the $830. Then I'm going to be crediting either my cash or my bank, or if I bought something in credit on credit, creditors with what? The $830. Make sense? So if the supplier I didn't pay him the $600, they will credit creditors account. Certainly these guys there will pay them. So those ones will go to cash. So that is what we call incorporation or the initial recognition of the assets. Once we look at what constitutes the cost of the assets, the question is, what is the recognition criteria of the assets? Recognition criteria. Usually, when it comes to assets, the recognition criteria of assets can be either two or three. One, that the cost can be measured reliably. So if the cost can be measured reliably, like this one especially, if the future cost to be incurred can be measured reliably, then it has to be what? Incorporated. Number two, future economic benefits of the assets will flow to the entity. So if we buy this laptop and it is for the CEO, his own personal use, meaning it's not for business purposes, 
then that laptop does not qualify to be recognized as what? Our asset. More so, it does not even qualify as a transaction that we are supposed to pay for. So when auditors come, this is what we'll be doing in auditing, when auditors come and we have been paid something or a cost, that is not for the business, it has to be what? Eliminated and financial statement must be adjusted. So costs can be measured reliably, future economic benefits can flow to the entity. These are the two real things that we can talk about for the recognition criteria of these assets. Now, after we recognize the assets, the next thing we need to ask ourselves is, what is the subsequent measurement? The standard states that, among other things, companies can decide to either adopt the cost module or the revaluation module. With the cost module, what it simply means is that the asset, the carrying value of the asset is equal to the cost minus accumulated depreciation. With the revaluation module, the carrying value of the asset is equal to the fair value minus accumulated depreciation and um, impairments. Which we will look at later on under IAS 36 impairments. What is fair value of an asset? Any idea? They actually, um, like, if assets, example, that like. So now you give me an example. So yeah, let's go. Let me hear an example. So fair value of an asset is simply the amount that the assets can be exchanged. Are you getting it? Through what we call an arm length transaction. So that is it about the uh, cost module and then the revaluation module. But let's take it a step further. When we are dealing with either the cost module or the revaluation module, there is a word there and that is called depreciation. What is depreciation? What is depreciation? What's the difference between depreciation and impairment? Yes. A liar has a tail. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. Depreciation is different from impairment. Okay, so give me depreciation. What's the when we say an asset, we are depreciating an asset, what does it mean? Uh, it's lost the value. Okay. Yeah, it has that connotation though, but it doesn't mean that it's losing its value. Usually the depreciation has to do with the cost of the assets that we allocate for the period of the usage of the asset. So for instance, if we buy the laptop for $850 and we say that we use the laptop for 10 years, then every year we will allocate $800 over 10, which is uh, $80 to the financial statement as part of the rating of cost because expenses must be matched against revenue, the matching concept. Mm -hmm. How are we getting it? So depreciation is that charge, the annual charge or allocation of cost of what? Plants and equipment. But impairment on the other hand is the loss in value of an asset. So with your example you gave earlier, that the cost of the laptop is 600 Ghana, and you sold it for 500 Ghana. In that case, the asset has lost value. So that extra hundred lost in value is referred to as impairment. I hope you get the difference, right? So we're gonna be depreciating the assets. And so 
there are usually a lot of methods. I think in F3 you look at a couple of methods of depreciation. But here we are going to be focusing on only two, the straight line method and then the reducing balance method. Tell me the difference between the two. So depreciation will be cost minus receivable value. value. All of the number of is like a period. Divided by the estimated useful life, life of the asset. Yes. Okay. What about the revaluation, uh, reducing balance? For straight line, so you can do percentage. I hope you know that one also. So what is the core distinction between straight line and reducing balance? The core distinction is that with a straight line method, the same amount of depreciation is charged over the estimated useful life of the asset. But with reducing balance method, the depreciation value reduces as the asset ages. So that's the core distinction. So yes, we can know this formula, but percentages can be given for straight line and reducing balance. And also, with reducing balance, the depreciation of the asset is calculated on the carrying value of the asset. That's a very uh, important thing you need to understand. So the percentage which is given to you is 25%, and you are using reducing balance, you will do the 25% on the carrying value of the asset, which is the cost of the asset minus the accumulated depreciation. But if he says 25% straight line, straight line, you just do it on the cost of the asset. That is why the same amount will be charged over the estimated useful life of the asset. Are you getting that distinction? Right. So reducing balance, we charge it on the carry value. Straight line method, we charge it on the cost of the asset. Reducing balance, the depreciation figure reduces as the asset ages, but straight line method, the depreciation figure remains the same over the estimated useful life of the asset. Now, with a cost module, it's not a rocket science because it's simple. And you can do it, everybody can do it and you go away. You don't need any uh, um, magic to do that one. Basically, what happens is that once we calculate our depreciation, what will be the double entry for calculating depreciation? We debit depreciation in the income, income statement. Yeah. So income statement. Okay. And then we credit what? Property, plant, and equipment. Yes. Or someone will say accumulated depreciation. Are you getting it? Right. So that's the double entry. So with a cost module, it's not a rocket science. But it, it becomes an issue when the business uses the revaluation module. And the standard also says that companies must carry, or yes, entities must carry their assets not more than the fair value of the asset or below the fair value of the asset. For that reason, at least once every year, the company must what? Revalue an asset. So it is going to be the norm that many of our assets we're going to be using what? The revaluation module. But when the asset is revalued, two things can happen. Number one, an asset can be revalued upward or downward. Let's look at the upward revaluation first. When an asset is valued upward, what it simply means is that the current value of the asset Let's go this way. The fair value of the asset is greater than the carrying value of the asset. Does it make sense? So you are carrying the asset as 500, but now when you are selling it, you will sell it as 600. So the value is now 600. So that is upward revaluation. Anytime there is upward revaluation like that, what is the double entry? What's the double entry? You debit property, plant, and equipment. Then you credit revaluation reserves. Okay? So that's the double entry. You debit property because why are you debiting the property, plant, and equipment? 
because the amount should go up. It is less than the fair value. So the excess is what you will debit with the property, plants, and equipment, and then you credit revaluation reserves. Now, immediately you do revaluation, it means that depreciation should be or must be calculated on the revalued amount of the assets. Depreciation must be calculated on the revalued amount of the assets. So, if the current value of the asset is $500, and we revalue it as the fair value to become, say, $600, what is the excess? $100. It is this $100 that we are saying that you should debit property, plants, and equipment with the $100 and then credit the revaluation reserves also with $100. But this is a key statement. Depreciation must be calculated on the revalued amount of the assets. What it means is that if the estimated useful life of the asset is say, tech, uh, is say five years, what is left now, remaining useful life of the asset is five years. What it means is that instead of having a depreciation under the historical cost, the depreciation under historical cost will be 500 divided by five, and that gives us 500 divided by 5? 100. 100. But then, we won't charge 100 to the income statement, as we saw earlier. We will going to be using the revaluation module. So with the revaluation module, the depreciation will not be on the 500, but rather 600 over what? 5. 5. What do I have? 120. 120. If you check, there is an extra Depreciation of how much? $20. The question is, what happens to our profits? Profit will reduce because cost has increased. There are times when, when this thing happens, the company has to uh, compensate shareholders for the increase in their uh, uh, expenses and the reduction in their profits. To compensate them, Companies would undertake what we call annual transfer. The annual transfer will be done from the revaluation reserve account to the retained earnings using the remaining useful life of the assets. So if you check, how much do we put there? 100. So the transfer is going to be 100 divided by the useful life of the assets, 5 which is going to be $20, just the same as this amount. So that the double entry for this now becomes you debiting the revaluation reason. To reduce this amount by 20, then now you credit your retained earnings with the 20. So that your retained earnings will now increase because dividends are paid out of retained earnings. This is what we do when there is upward revaluation. Does it make sense? But this is not always done. It depends on the question. It depends on the question. There is an aspect of revaluation also that we will be doing under IAS 12, income tax. So put this concept at the back of your mind because when we get there, there will be deferred tax issue that we have to talk about when there is upward revaluation of an asset. Second, can I go? Right. Second, downward revaluation. So when there is upward revaluation, it means the fair value of the asset is greater than the current value of the asset. It's a good news for the company. But this one, it's a bad news. Because here, it means the current value of the asset is greater than the fair value of the asset. 
In such circumstances, downward revaluation can occur in two ways. Number one, downward revaluation can occur as a first time. As a first time, or downward revaluation can occur in a subsequent year after upward revaluation and the treatments are different. So if it is the first time, like this illustration we did, where the asset was revalued upward, the treatment is going to be different from if it is what? A subsequent year's downward revaluation. So let's look at how that works. First time, downward revaluation. So if it is first time, current value of the asset $600, fair value of the asset $500. So this is a downward revaluation. Now, in actual sense, this is more or less like impairment loss. It means the asset has suffered what? An impairment. Yeah. For that reason, this is an expenses. So what we do is that we will just debit the income statement with that impairment loss and then credit the property, plant and what? Equipment. And that is $100.